On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Dario Cortez. Berkeley College believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect our daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and the partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Roche, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, I'm going to introduce you to a really good, people say friend of the show. I mean really a great friend of the show. He is Michael Port. He's the author of a wonderful book you ought to go out and get. It is called Book Yourself Solid, Illustrated. Yeah. Now, we had Michael on last time talking about uh, his writing. Book Yourself Solid, one of my favorite books right there in my uh, library of business books that I always go back to when I'm struggling to figure out how to make it work. What is Book Yourself Solid and what's Book Yourself Solid, Illustrated? So Book Yourself Solid is the first edition and it has 90,000 words. So people often say, I love the book, but I didn't finish it because you know something came up or I don't love to read. And so the premise I, of that is? It's how to get as many clients as your heart desires. That's it. So um, I thought, well, I gotta figure out a way to reach the people who are not finishing or who don't love to read and wanna you know, get this information quickly. So I said, we have to illustrate it. Let's see if we can give people an opportunity to see the concept so they can absorb them much more quickly. And as a result, put it into action, which at the end of the day is the key. Right? You know, it's so interesting. Michael talks about your clients. And by the way, if you're not, if you don't think of, your, of, of the people you serve as clients, forget it. That has nothing to do with that. Those of us in public television, sponsors are clients. clients. Yeah. You run a, um, a furniture store. Yeah. Customers are clients. Everyone has clients. clients. So yeah. don't get caught up in that word, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's people you serve. That's the bottom line. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of my sort of core um, philosophies is stand in the service of others as you stand in the service of your own destiny or future. Because um, if we want to be noticed, if we want to be popular, if we want people to pay attention to what we're selling or our big ideas, we need to be relevant. And the easiest way in the world to be relevant is by being helpful, mm. right? And we always talk about that. Yeah. So if someone comes on your show, they get all nervous, I got to be good, I got to be good. They shouldn't think about that. They should just think about how can I be helpful on the show? That's it. And they'll do a great job as a result. It's so funny. In the other part of my work where I coach people on their communication skills, yeah. I often say to them, I know you're nervous, but ask yourself, how do I want to, how can I be helpful to this yeah. audience? And they'll say, oh, no, that hasn't, that's not it. I go, how much, they'll say, how much do I have to know? No. Yeah. That's not it. Yeah, it's not an intellectual uh, um, exercise. exercise, right? It it's really is about, and look, Every single person knows how to be helpful. The question is, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do it in a way that you are still fully self-expressed? So you're not taking yourself and putting it aside. There's a balance between your service and what you uh, achieve or receive. It's not quid pro quo. That's right. Right? But if you believe in the law of reciprocity, you'll do good for others. Uh, Michael's been with us many times, and I've learned so much from him, and um, you're going to learn as well. And he, by the way, Book Yourself Solid Illustrated, he did it also because he said most people like to see some visuals. They learn that way. Uh, we're going to show just two examples of uh, Michael's book or pieces of Michael's book. This one is the four-part sales formula. When we see the visual, describe what we're looking at right here. Every single sales conversation has four parts to it. It's not a script. It doesn't right. always go in the same order, but you need to know what somebody wants to achieve. Because if, they, if you don't know that, and if they're not clear on it, 
it's very hard to move to the next step. And the next step is, okay, well, why? Because there may be financial benefits uh, of that achievement. There may be emotional benefits. There mm. may be physical benefits. There may be spiritual benefits. And so if we know what they want to achieve and we know why they want to achieve it, then we can ask them, well, do you want someone to help you? I'm looking at the visual right now, though, Michael. And that's the cycle? Yeah. One, two, three, four. But uh, hold on. What is the difference between me seeing that, yeah. your readers seeing that, people yeah. read the book, and simply listing, all right, here are the four things, do yeah. these things. Yeah. No pictures, no visuals, no nothing. What's the difference? It doesn't stick when it's just words. So I, I can go through boom, 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 boom. And you might remember one thing he said, you know, or a couple words here and there. But if you can see it, A, you can put yourself in that situation. So if there's a little person running through the finish line, you can see yourself there. And you could always go back to it. If you're about to have a sales That's conversation right. on the phone, whip out that illustration. There it is. Boom. If it's just words, you're not going to be able to follow. But a picture? That. You can follow the picture. I remember that picture. Yeah. I know what I need to do. Exactly. You know, so interesting. Michael was very helpful. And um, the last book I, I wrote, uh, You Are the Brand, you were very yeah, kind to, that. To, to write something nice. So good. I don't know if it was true, but it was nice. It was um, always true. So that, the reason I say that isn't to be self-promotional which is the good segue here, is because you talk about the six keys, guys, help me on this, is the six keys to, uh, oh, the six core strategies of, so of promotion, right? Yeah, the six core self-promotion Branding is part of it, right? Absolutely. So let's talk, this yeah. looks complicated to me, help me. Well, it's kind of simple. I mean, they're fundamental. I don't think your audience will think they're new. Developing deeper relationships with the people and that people, you already And people, what are they doing? They're holding hands. Yeah, they're connecting, they're sharing. You know, I have a, a very simple networking strategy. I say, int introduce two people every day that do not yet know each other, but would like to know each other. Sure. Share information with at least one person every single day that's relevant to them, and share some compassion with somebody every single day. You do that every single day. Over the course of a month, you've kept in touch with 80 people. And you are building. You're building a serious network. Put that up again, guys. Uh, direct out. Do you have to do every one of these, No, that, that's the thing. No, no, no. For example, speaking or, or writing strategies, if you don't want to be a public speaker, don't do it. Don't? don't? I often tell my clients, you got to get out there and you got to speak. No, I don't think so. Because what if you hate it? What if they do. Some of them say, I, I, no, I want to give me anything else to do. Yeah. Well, maybe there's other things they can do instead. So maybe they like to write. So maybe they can blog instead. Or maybe they can write articles uh, for other influencers who serve that same target market. So we absolutely need to work on our skills of persuasion, our right. ability to speak and persuade. But I don't, I'm not sure everybody should speak to an audience of 5,000 people. You're saying play to your strength. Absolutely. And not all of those six. You don't have to do all no. the six, but you're showing them visually. No. Like think web strategies, for example. Of course, you have to have a very good website that starts a conversation, converts a potential buyer so you can follow up. Mm. But do you have to go into hardcore network? I mean, hardcore uh, uh, pay-per-click advertising, uh, search engine optimization? Not, not really. Mm. And some people will argue that point with me. But we're talking about um, service professionals, smaller business owners, building a reputation. And you need to build a reputation based on what is natural to you, what is mm. easy to you, what is comfortable for you. Because it's a lot easier to demonstrate who you are in that process and ultimately, we're buying you. We watch this show because Buy of you. Buy my stuff, no? No, you. No, I, I want your book because of what you brought to it, because of what you stand for, your style, your tone, the way you see the world. That's what we're buying. And so um, we connect to big companies this way too when there's a figurehead like a Richard Branson. Mm. But most importantly, when we're looking at especially service businesses that uh, are run by individuals, sometimes even just that individual, that's who we're buying. Because the first thing I want to know, do you help someone like me get what I want? Right. And if the answer is yes, then I'm looking at, well, why do they do this? Why do they get up every morning to do this work? Is it for the 10% commission? Or is it because there's something bigger that they stand for and they want to share that with me? It's very personal. It's very personal. personal. Um, yeah. and Look, I, you know, people say there's a difference between personal and business. It, I don't buy it. It's all the same thing. And on a personal and a business level, that's why we like having Michael here. Book Yourself Solid Illustrated, Michael Port. He's one of our favorite guests. He's a friend of the show, and he adds a lot. And that's why we have him. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You're so it. kind. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So I'm Steve Adubato. We're at the Tish WNET Studios right here in beautiful Lincoln Center. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. There he is, Tim Fetterly, author of a wonderful book called Better Nate Than Ever.
How you doing, Tim? I'm good, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. Who is Nate? Well, Nate is uh, the 13-year-old protagonist of this new novel for kids. And he's uh, theater obsessed, like I was when I was a kid. Were you? Yo, yeah. Growing up where? Oh, in Pittsburgh. And big, when you're theater, theater obsessed, town? it you know it is a big theater town. Once people get past the sort of layers joke, of no, no, I know it's it's a huge sports town. But yep. when you get past the stadiums, there are theaters hiding behind the stadiums. You know, there's a huge character on PBS from the PBS world from Pittsburgh. Who is it? Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Mr. Rogers. And that's it. And that's PBS a wrap. Trivia. That was good. Yeah, Go Mr. Ahead. Rogers. Is so great. good theater town. Go ahead. Great theater town. And I was obsessed with theater. Uh, I went to a school where if you weren't a sports star. You weren't a star. So I was, you know, I moved to New York uh, to dance on Broadway. So Nate in the book, in Better Nate Than Ever, he, uh, he, he runs away from Pittsburgh. He crashes an audition for E.T. the musical, and the book is about his kind of coming of age adventure. Your background is fascinating, the work that you've done. Um, you don't mind if I name drop? Please. You've done some work in connection with um, Sting. Sting, yes, there was a Carnegie Hall thing. Two of our producers, uh, Jacqueline Velez is in love with Sting. She, uh, she uh, stalked ailment. him and took a picture when he was coming out of a Broadway theater. And Mary Ellen, <laughs> Mary Ellen Murphy, they're both obsessed with him. And you worked with him. Yeah, he's the nicest guy, too. He is. There's sort of a yoga sheen that happens. He's got like a bubble of yoga around him. Too bad he's lost his looks, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's really <laughs> let himself go, that poor guy. What'd you do with him? You say you I quit, yeah, yeah, so he, so my, you know, when you're involved in the theater, you can't get away from it, even though I'm writing now. So I choreographed, he has this great rainforest foundation that yep. he runs with his fabulous wife, Trudy. Yep. And so they do a concert. And so they, you know, talk about name dropping. It's Merrill and Elton and... Look at you. Oh, yeah, so he calls his friends and he says, hey, you want, hey, you want to come to Carnegie Hall and put on a show? <laughs> and then they needed somebody to choreograph it. So I did like a, a Singing in the Rain thing starring Sting and, and then uh, there, James Taylor. I did a little polka with him and Rita Wilson. Not the three of us. That would have been awkward. I set it on them and then they did it. That's great stuff. Um, and always, you know, the biggest stars are the nicest, which you really do learn. You know, you we are, aren't we? Oh yeah, it's I'm you, sorry. Steve Sting, all the S names, but yes. it's, they're the nicest because that's sort of what got them so far. That's good stuff. And the other thing <laughs> about your background I find fascinating Theory. is the Billy Elliot connection. Yeah. Um, you worked with the child stars in connection with Billy Elliot. Talk, I did. set that up for us because that's a very powerful. Because um, I told you, I saw the I saw Billy Elliot the yeah. movie the first time. Great stuff. And no, then talk killer, about the theater it? piece of it. Yeah, so I, I moved to New York to dance myself. And then what after year? Uh, 2000. And how old were you? I mean, you were I was 19. Young. Yeah. Did you know this is where it had to oh, be? Oh, yeah. Yeah. From I Pittsburgh skipped directly? college. Yeah, I got on a bus. I Get out of here. Did, now you're going to tell a story that sounds no, good. No, it's is true. It really true. It's true. I was a Christina Aguilera backup dancer, not to keep dropping names, but I was a Christina Aguilera backup dancer at the Super Bowl in Atlanta. Couldn't tell you the teams, but it wasn't Atlanta. And, uh, and that was sort of when I went, you know, I'm going to skip college and see if I can actually make a go of this. So I got to Billy Elliot after dancing in, an, in a bunch of Broadway shows. Um, I never played a man. I was always like a catfish in Little Mermaid. I was like, <laughs> someday I'll be a human. And then when I was uh, just about to turn 30 a couple years ago, I was on the artistic staff of Billy Elliot. And my job was to work with these very sweet kids, the boys and the girls in the show, and I was part of a team of people that cast them in the show, trained them, and drilled the dances into them. And that's what inspired me to write Better Nate. You know, Nate in this book, mm -hmm. you know, his sexuality is not overtly talked about. Yeah. But is an important theme in terms of how he interacts with other people and other people interact with him. Mm -hmm. No? Uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of, I'm glad you brought it up. It's the story. Is I have to bring of, it up. No, I, I appreciate know. it. The story is it's an aspirational story of following your dreams, following Nate's dreams. And I consider sort of Nate's sexuality, he's 13, he's just about to turn 14. And it's sort of the C or maybe even the D story. Nate is far more interested in donuts and musicals than he is in other boys. But he's 13 and he's starting to have that dawning awareness. And so I didn't want to hit it with a hammer. I wanted to just kind of drop it in there lightly because um, I'm gay and I felt like I would have really uh, benefited from reading a story when I was a, a, a teenager, even a little bit younger, that showed a character who was questioning and thinking about his sexuality, but not in an obsessive way, 
and not in a guiltier or sort of, you know, suicidal way. And that felt important to me. There's so many stories out there. Mm -hmm. We see it every single day, Steve. We see these stories of kids who get to the end of the line. And so I wanted to tell a different story of a kid who's going on a different path where even though his community doesn't understand him nor his parents, um, he's going to find a way to have a great life. And that's just one of those pieces. I'm wondering how challenging it must have been to try to write a story that's entertaining. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's an audience for it, a mass, if you will, audience, but at the same time, feel this responsibility to try to weave in yeah. without the hammer. Yeah. That piece of it. How hard? Uh, n I was very lucky. I, I wrote the book with a great amount of ignorance. I had not done um, purposefully, I had kept myself away from the odds. You know, the odds of getting published are actually pretty small. So had I done all that research, I think I would have talked myself out of it. When my agent found um, a home at Simon & Schuster, I found this great editor named David Gale, who one of his legacies, among many legacies, is he's published certain books that have really broken some molds uh, in terms of sexuality. Sure. And, and so he and the entire staff at Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers was incredibly embracing of this idea that, you know, it's a, it's a novel, so it's like a real, it's a sit-down book, but every 25 pages there's a little reference that says, oh, he's thinking about this, and they didn't ask me to edit any of that out. They just got it. The ages, because we have a boy who's 10, yeah. another boy who's 8. Give me the Good ages. Luck. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a losing battle already. Yeah. Question, who is the book for? And, and is it right for them? Yeah. Well, the, you know, the marketing answer is the book is for 9 to 14-year-olds who love Glee and love Pitch Perfect and, and have big story. I, What's I, the real answer? I think the real answer is it's for uh, kids and adults who have aspirational dreams. Or you know, I'm getting actually a surprising number of emails from parents and teachers who have read the, books before, but the book before they show it to their kids and they say, oh my gosh, I really laughed at this because it reminded me of why I came to New York or why I love musicals. Right. Um, I think the book is, is a mature choice for nine-year-olds, but I think it is, uh, it's aimed squarely at 10, 11, 12, and 13-year-olds. I'm just thinking, because our 10-year-old son, Nick, uh, sings in the chorus, yeah. loves to perform, and I'm thinking to myself, how would he handle the parts about yeah. it that make reference to without yeah. the hammer? Right. Um, I just don't know. I'm curious. No, it's a good question. And I haven't read I, it, I've so we'll find out. I've heard from enough girls and kind of like macho boys who say, you know, I got such a kick out of it. And I think it's because it's threaded, and that was actually purposeful to me, to, to, to remind people. Before I let you out of here, do you yeah. mind if I ask you to talk about your sequel? Yeah. Five, six, seven, Nate? Yes. Go. Five, six, seven, Nate explores the further adventures of Nate Foster on his way to E.T. the Broadway musical, and it comes out next January 2014 from Simon & Schuster. You're not a full-time full writer these I days? I am, yeah, because I've got a cocktail book called Tequila Mockingbird coming out next month. It literary, is called literary, what? Literary cocktails. Co <laughs> Tequila Mockingbird cocktails with a literary twist, including The Last of the Mojitos and Are You There, God, It's Me, Margarita. And perfect for 10-year-olds. <laughs> yeah, no, it's for their parents. <laughs> for ever, any parent who has a kid who's singing at the top of his or her lungs, this is the book to read to drown out the singing. I love it. The book is called Better Nate Than Ever. Tim Federley is the uh, author. Listen, it's the first time you've joined us here at our WNET a studio at the uh, Tisch Center. I promise you'll come back. I would love to. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. All Pleasure. the best. I'm Steve Adubato. Stay with us. This is one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be right back. Thank you very much. Yes. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ph.D. We welcome for the first time our very good friend, Dr. Jeff Gardier, who is a psychologist and assistant professor at the Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. Good to see you. Great to see you, Steve. Last time I saw you, we were uh, both poking around over at another show down the street. That's right. That's yeah. right. The Today Show. Um, you're there all the time. They have you as an expert dealing with very difficult, complex mm -hmm. issues involving the family, uh, relationships, uh, cyberbullying, a whole bunch of stuff, right? Uh, criminal profiling. Uh, I, I think one of the things that uh, we are experiencing now as uh, citizens of the planet, 
trying to figure out why so many bad things happen and how we can keep them from happening in the future. And the only way that you can do that is to make sense of it, understand the ideology of it, understand where it came from, how it develops, and what you can do to perhaps uh, work with that information to help people not go in those inappropriate or really bad places. You know, in a minute I want to talk about divorce because you've talked about uh, what a healthy divorce is and there's a healthy sure. divorce app we'll talk about in a second. Yes. <clears throat> but one of the things that I've seen you talk about and uh, our, when we crossed our paths on, on other shows um, is that you talk a lot about the impact of social media. That's right. And the impact social media and technology has on family mm -hmm. life that we become isolated to some extent from I, our kids and I, a whole bunch of other stuff's going on. Yeah, I truly believe that we become isolated from one another, uh, especially from our kids. Our kids understand the computers, they understand the internet, they understand a lot of that IT stuff. I still go to my kids whenever I need something fixed as far as the electronics. Uh, I think as parents, we just need to be much more involved uh, with the net, with the social networking, because this is the way that we are really going to connect with our kids. It's here. It is what is happening now. And if we don't join them, then we are truly going to lose them because they're going to be in that virtual world and we're going to be wondering what's going on. And that isolation just isn't good because we're losing that human touch and that's so important to raising very healthy children. But Jeff, there are times with, with our, our 10 and 8 year olds where they'll, we'll be in their room for an hour or so and, and I'll say to my wife, hey, what's going on with those guys? Where are they? And mm -hmm. they'll be in there. They're, they're chatting with their friends or doing right. their thing and I'll come in and I'll say, hey guys, and they'll just say, dad, will you come? Is, is right. it dinner time? And I'll say, no, it's not dinner time, but I just want to talk to you. And they'll roll their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find a balance between giving them their space and being in their lives. Well, you've given them their space. You've given them the privilege of being able to play a lot of these uh, video games that they're on. But I think in order to lure them in, and mm. it is a little bit of being the Pied Piper, we have to think of another way, as I, as I like to say, flip the script and trick the devil, is to perhaps join them on some How? of those. They don't want, my, my older son <laughs> won't let me friend him on his Facebook page because he doesn't want me seeing what's going on. I had to go through, sure. I, now he's going to find out. <laughs> I only know through someone else. Right. Well, you have to find something that interests them. Uh, bringing them some of the games or introducing them to some of the social uh, networking where you are the role model, you're the alpha, you're the one who's saying, hey, look, this is how this works. Would you like to try something new? Kids have a lot of curiosity. Mm. And every study has shown that even though uh, children want to be independent of their parents, uh, teenagers want that individuation, they have that teen rebellion, which is considered normal. At the end of the day, they do rely on their parents to lead the way, whether it's on the internet, whether it's, it's, it's uh, a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if you will. Uh, they want that, they demand it, and they'll challenge you by pushing you away, but it's just pushing the limits and you just bring them back in. And doctor, whether those parents are together or they are not, the responsibility is still the same. So if they are not together, let's talk about yeah, sure. uh, the healthy, if you will, divorce. The Healthy Divorce app, what is it and how can people access it? Well, the Healthy Divorce app uh, I put together uh, because of the long years working with what couples. What are people looking at right now? Uh, they're looking at uh, the, uh, one of the, the opening pages of the app. Uh, where they have Q&A, uh, they learn about the stages of the app, uh, stages of, of, of divorce. Uh, they can go on and we have a bank of questions, 300 qu uh, answers to their questions. Why do people need this? Well, they need it because too many people, uh, when they divorce, uh, they not only divorce one another, but they end up divorcing their kids. Kids become the collateral damage because they are so angry with one another. So I say, look, we want to work with people to have healthy divorces. I try to keep people together in their marriages, but divorce is not a bad word, and some people need to go there. So every divorce should be a healthy divorce. I put it together not just as a psychologist, but all the years that I've known you, one of the things we haven't discussed is that I had a divorce quite recently. And I had a divorce years 17 years ago and didn't know how the heck to handle it. Legally, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Emotionally, psychologically, dealing with a three-year-old at the time is now 20. That's Not right. a clue. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's right. And so the bottom line is, with this Healthy Divorce app, uh, whenever you feel that you're about to lose your temper, whenever you feel that you're about, you know, to do something really stupid, make a decision while you're angry, you can go to the Divorce app and be able to get the right answers, how to calm yourself down, mm -hmm. how to speak to your attorney, how to avoid conflicts with that person person who you are divorcing, but most importantly, how to co-parent in a healthy way. Just as you said, Steve, too often we let these divorces infect our relationships with our children. In fact, if we can't be together, then let's be the best parents that we can possibly be, especially if we're not living in the same house. Before I let you out here, Jeff, i got to ask you this. All the years I've known you, all the shows we've done on the commercial side together, I've always been struck by how calm you are and how you always seem to have the right answer and give advice. Yeah. Question, how the heck do you practice what you preach? Uh, do people I, call you when you don't, call you on it when you don't? And they do call you on it, but here's the deal, and this was even with my divorce and raising my own children. I've had several books on raising children. If you talk the talk, you better walk the walk. So I force myself to do the right things, to be calm, to follow the advice that I give, because if you don't follow the advice, what you're giving to other people is disingenuous, and they're going to see right through you. They'll see that you're a fraud, so you can't do that. You check yourself a lot, don't you? I do check myself. And that was the other reason that I put that app together because it's a way to check <laughs> yourself. It's a reality check, yeah. one, two, three. Pull this thing out, look at it. Are you doing the right things? Yeah. Ask the questions, and that's what you can do. But I think as parents, we need yeah. to check ourselves every day because we need to be role models to our children. That's the most important thing. They're looking at us for all of the right information. I saw you interacting with your kids. Your kids look up to you as a role model, and you're a great role model for them. Oh, I appreciate that. And you're too wonderful on commercial television. You're even better on public television. Oh, Thank you, Jeff. You're the man. Thank you for having Thank you, me. Partner. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, TSE&G, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Roche, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by New Jersey State Nurses Association. New Jersey nurses play a key role in the lives of everyone, from a school nurse teaching a diabetic child about injections, to a visiting nurse helping an elderly mother die at home, or someone like me, a nursing administrator for a healthcare organization. Whatever the role, nurses are there for you. And the New Jersey State Nurses Association has been protecting the practice of nursing and quality patient care since 1902, because caring for you and your families is what is most important to us.